السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يوتيوب كيف الحال يا يوتيوب How are we doing brother and sister بسم الله الحمد لله that was nice what we saying Jesus how we doing how we doing how we doing how we doing so first things first do your boy a solid Make sure you like the video on your way in. All right, just like the old video on your way in here and subscribe to the channel. All right, I had a look at my analytics the other day and I posted it on, on the old community. And it turns out 93% of you scallywags are not subscribed to the channel. Mad violation. 93% of you guys who watch me are not subscribed to the channel. I've never heard of such a high stat of ninja watchers watching one channel flipping. I thought 50% was bad. Only 6% of those of you who watch me are actually subscribed to the channel. So do your boy a solid and subscribe to the channel. Barakallahu feekum. I would appreciate this very much. Yani. It would be very helpful. It will help with my vanity metric being uh, the vanity metric being the uh, what do you call uh, subscriber. Subscriber and, and like and subscribe and all these good things. Thank you very much. Every day I get one, e no, at least more than one. I get a few emails or DMs, collectively maybe five to ten emails or DMs a day of you guys vomiting your life stories on me with all of your problems. Let me just tell you something, all right? I don't care. And let me tell you why I don't care. Because you're selfish. You are selfish. You know... When you go through enough of these emails on a daily basis or DMs, it's even worse on DM because people don't make paragraphs. So it's just like, it's vomit. When you go through enough of them and people are trying to steal your time without offering any value in return, brother, I don't care. I don't care. What value are you offering me first? Oh, brother, do it for the sake of Allah. Habibi, if I did it for the sake of Allah, all I'd be doing is on Instagram DM or Gmail all day long. I'd be doing nothing else. So please, if you want to get my attention, start with what value you are offering me. Brother, how do I book a session? You see, amongst the Muslims, we have this mentality. I've called it the Akhi discount mentality. Many of us Muslims have no problem doing business and spending money on non-Muslim brands, companies, products, services. The moment we find out my guy is a Muslim, oh brother, do it for the sake of Allah. No! You will pay me for the sake of Allah. How about that? Did you ever think of it like that? Pay me for the sake of Allah. And I'm getting angry because a lot of you are going through a lot of legitimate issues. When I read through some of these emails or some of these DMs, you're going through legitimate issues. But it's not legitimate enough for you to pay for someone you've gone out of your way to ask a question of, which means you actually value their opinion. It's not enough for you to pay for their time. The moment you have to pay for their time, like, oh no, it's not that important. Okay, fine. Don't tell me your life's falling apart. Don't tell me your wife's about to leave you. Don't tell me your husband's got limp dick syndrome because he's got a a, a severe porn addiction. Like, no, I don't care. You need to care about my time and then I will care about the time that I devote to you. Please get out, snap out this mindset of expecting the world to just give you like the world owes you something. It really doesn't. It owes you nothing. It owes you nothing. And what is given for free has no value. In fact, if I give you my time for free, I will be stealing the most important thing you have, which is your volition. Because you will be indebted towards me in one way or another, even if it is a moral debt, which is the worst type of debt that you can accrue. Because it's very difficult and grey and, and difficult to quantify. How do I know I've paid this debt off or not? Pay your way. Pay your way. Right. <clears throat> We've got a lot to get into. I was, uh, been, I'm was i in the middle of this podcast with uh, our brother Daniel Haqiqachu and Muhammad Hijab. I'm about three and a bit hours in. So five, five and a half hour podcast. And there's one segment in the middle that is around half an hour long that I really want to 
uh, provide a, a, a third voice on, if you like. Firstly and foremostly, this podcast was extremely intellectually stimulating. You know, there's a lot of junk food on YouTube, right? A lot of junk food in the way of content. And I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I really enjoy when two intellectuals come together, two powerhouse intellectuals come together and have an intellectual discussion, an intellectual conversation. It's really fruitful, really beneficial and very rare, frankly speaking, especially when you're on YouTube, which is just basically anyone creating any sort, any type of content. And for the most part, it's going to be junk food. For the most part, it will be junk food. But this podcast was absolutely not junk food. Both intellectual powerhouses, both very highly educated graduates from prestigious prestigious universities, Daniel Haqiqatru from Harvard, uh, brother Mohammed Hijab, I know one of his master's degrees is from Oxford, and he's doing his PhD right now as well. So very intellectually stimulating conversation. And one segment of the podcast is titled, he's got the timestamps here. What's it called? Mm, marriage crisis, who's to blame? And that's what we're going to be going over today. All right. So without further ado, we will hop straight into this. Present. Oh, by the way, let me before I get into that, I'm I'm really surprised at the number of Muslims who are suffering with a uh, porn addiction. I'm really surprised. I don't know why. I really shouldn't be surprised. I guess maybe it's naivete on my part. But I am surprised at the number of practicing Muslims who are suffering with porn addictions. I had a sister reach out to me last night. Her husband's had a porn addiction for many decades now, to the point where his his penis is completely limp. But imagine ejaculating and your penis is limp. Do you know how embarrassing that is? And she discovered it's because he's had a porn addiction that has lasted many years. Many years. His dopamine system has been fried in his brain. Completely fried. Allah al -mustan. Because And the real tragedy is that aside from that, she describes him as a very good man. And that's the real tragedy, because at least if he was a bad man, then we could say, Khalas, he's a bad man, but we can't even say that. He's actually a good man who has a really bad problem that has gone on for decades. And because of this, I have partnered up with a uh, an account that has been frequently recommended to me over and over and over, on and over and over, called My Tezkia. I haven't partnered up with them. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is that I've arranged the podcast with them. It was meant to be for tomorrow until I realized I forgot that I'm actually a guest on Brother Nasir Al Alamin's podcast tomorrow. So it will be for the following Friday. I get a lot of DMs and emails from you guys uh, frequently about your porn addiction or your masturbation addictions or, you know, that type of stuff in general. So, and I have absolutely, yani, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, I'm very grateful to Allah to say this, but I have no experience in this, none whatsoever, none, really none. So I am not, I can't give you my advice. You guys ask me for advice, how to overcome it. I don't know. Wallahi, I don't know. So I reached out to my Tezki and I said to him, look, I've been in touch with you. I've been recommending you guys many times on my stories because everyone keeps telling me about you, but I don't actually know who you guys are. So we had a conversation and backwards and forwards. I was like, okay, I need to bring you one because this porn and masturbation thing in the Muslim community, it's real. It's real. It's a real thing. It's happening. It's very common, far more common than uh, than I thought. And it's sad, really, because our religion has many uh, has many barriers in place to prevent this from happening. And that's why I'm surprised. Because if you're a practicing Muslim and you you practice the religion of, but on a basic level, according to what you're supposed to do, you'll never fall into this. Allah says in the Quran, for example, "Wala taqrabu zina," and don't go anywhere near. Zina, anything. He didn't say don't perform the act of zina. He said don't go anywhere near it, meaning that that includes the gaze, looking twice at someone. That includes uh, chit chatting to women online, following their accounts. Bruv, find me one account that I follow on my Instagram. I might live to regret this. Find me one account that I follow on Instagram that's a female that is not my relative. Either she's my wife or she's she's my relative. I don't follow these women, bruv. I don't fall billah that a woman will get my fault. Me, Mahdi, will follow you on Instagram. Are you mad? That's like a major validation. Hell no. Don't follow them. Don't like them. Please waste the time. I shout out to Abu American in the chat. I have a uh, salam alaikum akhi Abu American. I have a I have a porn addiction specialist on my channel tomorrow. I have a point. Excellent. Excellent. Khalas, yeah, I mean, you guys make sure you tune into this, inshallah ta'ala. 
Make sure you tune into Abu American's channel. Sub his channel, by the way. Barakallahu fiqh Abu American. I have my Teskia on next week, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, Sajid Lipham. Shout out to brother Sajid Lipham in the chat. Zakallah khair for the $6 super chat. Mm, I have a feeling I'm developing. <laughs> is this really Sajid Lipham or is this... Uh, uh, this is a troll account. I think this is a troll account. Wallah I think that's a troll account. But anyway, I'll take your 6 bucks su super chat. So yes... I will be having my Teskia on our channel next week, inshallah ta'ala. Um, so we can go through this stuff. But if you are a young man who is suffering with a porn or mast masturbation addiction of some sort, then I will say to you this. And that is, there are triggers that are causing you to relapse. One of those triggers that is most likely causing you to relapse is this here. This, oh, my kids. Is this phone right here? This phone, how? I'll tell you how. You wake up first thing in the morning, you open up your Instagram feed, you start scrolling, scrolling. You see a pretty woman, or you go onto Twitter. Twitter is even worse, by the way, because from what I understand, uh, Boron is, is legit on Twitter. You can actually post pornographic images on Twitter without it getting censored. So, Twitter is even worse. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Oh, you see a beautiful woman, or she's dressed provocatively or her assets are displayed in some way, shape, or form, boom. It's triggered. It's in your mind. You go straight to the bathroom or wherever it is, and then you're stuck in this vicious cycle. So the only piece of advice I can give to you is if your situation is to, is to this degree, Habibi, you need to get rid of this phone. You need to get rid of the phone. You need to buy yourself a Nokia brick phone, okay? If you don't have enough self-control, to be able to control yourself in that regard, and that's okay, that's not a criticism, no problem. Don't control yourself. Don't put yourself in a situation where you have to control yourself. If I'm over, this is what I say with regards to women. Brother, I don't want to control myself with women. I don't want to. I, oh, you brother, you should control yourself. No, I don't want to control myself with women. That's why I don't spend time with them other than the ones that are halal for me. Because I don't want to have to spend my free time with a woman and we're talking and we're joking and we're laughing. Not to mention she's getting my validation for free. All right? She's not getting that whatsoever. But let's just say, I don't want to have to control myself. I don't want to. If you find yourself in this situation whereby your addiction has gotten to a point where just scrolling through your phone can trigger a relapse, get rid of the phone. You don't need to control yourself. Get rid of the phone for a period of time, however long. And get yourself a nice brick phone. Nokia brick. That's what we grew up on. I can't believe I'm speaking like this. You know, I'm actually getting older and it's kind of weird. <laughs> it's kind of weird. I'm like, back in my day, we had brick phones. You know what my first phone was? It was the Nokia flip phone. Do you remember it? You press a button up here and it goes, just snaps out like that. What was it called? It was in year eight that my dad gave it to me. And if, if you top, you had to top up with like 10 pounds. And it was 10p a text. I never forget. So 100 text messages and it's done. Your whole 10 pounds finished. I can't remember what. Anyway, then the Matrix phone, the Nokia Matrix flip phone, like that. That was my first phone. Habibi Yuma, shout out to you, bro. Jazakallah khairan, Habibi. Barakallah fiqh. Shout out to you. Walaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So get rid of your phone. Okay. That's about as much advice as I can give you. I know nothing about this that discussion. But inshallah ta'ala, next week when I bring our brother, I don't actually know the brother's name, but my Tezkiya, whom you guys have recommended to me over and over for this discussion, khalas, I'm going to bring him on inshallah. And um, hopefully he can drop some gems with you guys. Okay. Now, we've got 267 of you guys in here. I would appreciate if you would like the video. Like the video. Let me see how I'm going to do this. What's the best way for me to do this? Hmm. If I make that large, let me see. One second, guys. Just trying to figure out the best way for me to do this. Khalas, yani. We'll continue like this because I'm going to have to switch backwards and forwards between that screen and this. Can you guys see uh, clearly? Just let me know in the chat if you can see the screen clearly. If the screen is clear for you, let me know. Barakallahu fikum. Bismillah. Uh, Alhamdulillah. And you know what? At the beginning of this, uh, somebody let Brother Daniel know that because Brother Daniel received the super chat from Sergeant Lipham, supposedly. 
making a criticism of some sort. But now that I've seen this six euro super chat up here, which is supposedly from Sergeant Lipham, and I, I do not believe this is him. He would not write a comment like this. I have a feeling I'm developing a porn addiction. So it might have been a troll account. So just let brother Daniel know that it seems to be there's a troll account. Wallahu alam commenting on his behalf. Okay. Let's get into this. Bismillah. A couple more rapid fire questions for you. Yeah. Uh, so what's your favorite proof for the existence of God? Oh, here's a rapid fire question. Uh, for you controversial question the muslim marriage crisis you acknowledge that there's a crisis yeah yeah from yes yes there is okay especially and in the west especially in the west okay yeah who do you think is more at fault men or women and you can't say both women okay <laughs> i think the reason why is because i feel like um women uh, have the, we know that women are more hypergamous in nature we know that they're picky and maybe they should be but I think that at the end of the day, they're becoming more and more picky. Now, the reason why I say that is that well, I've been looking at these uh, this data from like Muslim apps, dating apps and stuff like that. And I've been looking more and more into it. And it's um, the, the like and dislike, swipe right, swipe left, I don't know what it is, ratio is so much in favor of uh, women. Like, in, 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 So they would like less and they would be engaging less. And I think the reason why is because the standards of living in the West are quite high, actually. And I feel like uh, women feel like I'm not going to settle. I'm not going to settle with this guy. Whoever is the guy that comes along. And what I feel like is going to happen now is that Muslim men are going to go abroad and get married. It's going to get to the level where there's going to be a phenomenon of Muslim men going abroad, getting married. Um, and polygamy is going to increase because a lot of women are going to be like above a certain age with kids and stuff like that. And uh, these two things are going to happen. And women are going to find it harder and harder to get married because of this uh, not wanting to settle and stuff like that. Oh, there's a not okay. This is how I know this is a troll. I'm not even going to put it up. I'm not even going to put it up. But you can see there's a super, there's a six euro super chat in the chat claiming to be Abu American. He would never write something like this. He would never. So please, some one, one of you guys reach out to our brother Abu American as well. I'm not even going to read that out. <clears throat> All right, some donut, bruv, wants to pay. Pay me. Bruv, you know what? You can continue to pay me. I'm not even going to pull your comment up on the screen. Run me my peas, rude boy. Run that. Slave. Run it. Yeah, man. I'm not even going to pull it up. But somebody let our brother Ebbo American know, please, that someone's posturing as him when they are not. Now, first point that I want to touch on is an important point that our brother Muhammad Hijab mentions, which is the... The swiping, the, the dating apps and the environment it has created uh, or contributed towards the marriage problem. And that is that dating apps, marriage apps, whatever, they give women a false sense of their marriage value. They give them a false sense of their marriage market value. Why? Well, because the majority of men swipe right or left whichever way the one where they want to match with a woman and the majority of women that not only do they not uh swipe right or left whichever one it is to actually make a match but actually oftentimes women are just there to get their dopamine hit of social validation of validation from men oh look how many women swipe men swipe right on me today look how many men want to match with me and then she's good you know subhanallah it's the it's akin to looking at a woman in the street you know how we're meant to lower our gaze as muslims yeah you're meant to lower your gaze you know when you look at a woman when a woman knows she's made herself look nice and you look at her and she sees you looking in a lustful way that's validation for her it's validation i'll tell you a story i've told this story in one of my previous streams i have a friend we go to dinner often a business partner of mine excellent friend of mine and there's one place that he eats frequently at and he said in this place whenever the server would come to ask for us for food she was an attractive woman dressed in, a, in an attractive way i would always make a point of never even engaging eyes with her i wouldn't even give her my eye contact he said i'd like i'd give her the the menu like this like, yeah this is what i want this is what I want, like that and this happened a few times consecutively do you think the woman was offended do you think she was upset 
do you think she felt some type of way? I can tell she absolutely felt some type of way. You know why? Because she went up to one of my guy's friends and asked him, is this guy available for marriage? Talk about purple cow. You want to differentiate yourself in the market? Don't look at her. You know, when I see a beautiful woman from, a, from like far off, I can see oh, this woman's an attractive woman or she's dressed in a provocative manner. <clears throat> I love... I love doing this. If I see a woman and she's an attractive woman and I catch her from far off and I know she hasn't seen me, but I was like, oh, man, okay. Or she's dressed in a provocative manner. I will make sure that when our paths meet, that she sees me looking in a whole other direction. Not like making it so bait, like craning my neck like this, but I want her to know that she hasn't even registered on my radar. I want her to know that all of the makeup and all of the beautification couldn't get the the stare, the lustful stare of this man. I want her to know that she wasted her time. I want her to know that she should have put the hijab on. <laughs> All of this is validation. Women love, as, as much as they love to deny it as well, they love the validation or the attention from men and they love to deny it as well. And as much as they love to deny it, one thing that is a an undoubt, un, unambiguous fact is that Women love to be stared at from the gaze of men in a lustful manner. It makes her feel desired. And this is perfectly normal. And this is exactly what you should do with your wife. Right? You should do this with your wife. I like to make a point of looking like that way or on the floor or just busy on my phone. Did it even register you? Why? Because this is validation for her. You need to know this. This is validation. And these dating apps and these marriage apps have created inadvertently, perhaps almost innocently, this environment of women getting what they want immediately anyway, which is attention. But ultimately, people not getting married. I saw one app. They have, I think, 7 million users. I don't remember the name, which, which brand it is. So I'm not going to falsely say which name it is because I can't remember. 7 million odd users. Okay. And one of the things that they were very proud of is that they said from 7 million users, we have over 300,000 marriages. Like this is a flex. Bro, that's less than 1%. Let me just do the math real quick. 700,000, 70,000. No, that's more than 1%. 14, 21, 28. It's about 4%. 4.5%. Your success rate or the likelihood of you getting married on their, on their app, on their platform, according to them, is 4.5%. If I told you, you there is a four and a half percent chance of you getting married if you come to my marriage event, would you bother turning up? Would you bother even attending? Almost definitely you would not even bother attending. And yet this is exactly the flex. There's over 300,000 marriages, 7 million users. Rude boy, that's a four and a half percent conversion. That is not even, you know, they say the top 20% of men have access to the bottom 80. No, it's not. It's the top 5% of men. Perfect example there, by the way, in that one I just gave. The top 5% of men have access to 95% of women. 4.5%. And I'm not criticizing the app or the platform or whatever. I've got my own marriage app, not Shreens the Care, although it's at a way smaller level than those apps. And it's slightly different as well, to be fair. It's more community oriented. I'm just saying that one of the unintended consequences of these apps is that women have this endless buffet of choice to swipe through and then they suffer from the paradox of choice which is i have so all the, the yeah the paradox of choice there are so many options available to me i don't know which one to, to choose maybe i should just hold out and wait and that's exactly what they're doing by 2030 45 percent of all women between the ages of 25 to 44 will be single and childless you can find this article type on google rise of the she economy it's a morgan stanley report if i'm not mistaken which is a banking institution they want to know where are we going to put our money 10 years from now so that we can prepare early we can make our investments early and profit from the spinsterhood and childlessness of the next generation of women. 45% single and childless. This is one of, of many reasons why this is going to happen. 
Monjur Khuda, shout out to you for your five buck super chat. I appreciate it. Uh, I married back home and I advise brothers to do the same. The fact that they may not be a culture fit in the West is a big plus, not a negative. I mean, there's a, uh, there's a matter of ikhtilaf on this. I believe there are pros and cons. I have spoken personally to a number of different individuals who have married sisters from back home. Usually, actually, I'm not going to name countries. So they have married women from back home and eventually the marriage falls apart. And the reason why is there is such a chasm, there is such a massive gap difference in understanding between the two cultures. So you might be Indian, he might, she might be Indian, but you're actually British Indian and, and she's actually Indian Indian. And there's a big like gap in between whereby you find it hard to connect on that level, just general everyday conversation, banter, whatever. <coughs> And I know marriages that have fallen apart just on that. It's like I'm living with a housemate, a stranger. So I will say just bear that in mind. There are pros and cons to both. And by the way, I also don't believe that all Western women are write-offs as well. I don't believe in that. Not to mention that the East or the Muslim world in general is about 10 to 20 years behind from a feminism perspective to the West. So in the West, you can see things are turning around now, slowly, slowly. There's a there's a change in the air, in the zeitgeist, towards a more traditional uh, tra traditional leanings or traditional taste, going back to conservative values. You can see that, that tide turning. But they're 20 years behind in the Muslim world. They're just getting started on the whole feminism flex. Do you understand? So I believe there are pros and cons to both. You just have to be, you just have to be aware of that. Okay? All right, let's continue. Yeah, I mean, that would be a good result, actually. I'm more pessimistic. I think that men are just not going to get married. Women are not going to get married. They're just going to be alone. Like, there's going to be so? a large percentage of the population. Already, that's the case, but it's just going to get worse. Even with non-Muslims, you have, like, 40% wow. who are, like, incel, like, involuntarily celibate. Oh they can't God. find a partner. Forget no about marriage. Yeah, yeah. even... Even with dating, because you're 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 referring to it actually with the swiping right. So they'll go on these apps like Tinder or whatever, and they will swipe. The men will swipe right for every single female profile, and they will not match. They won't match at all. Yeah, it's absolutely uh, unbelievable. Yeah. So the women, the women do match up. So this is Tinder. These apps become great tools for the women to get with the top status men. You know, the high value men, so to speak. And the rest of men, they can't find anyone, whether it's on the app, whether it's in, through social interaction, even for Zina purposes, even for like dating purposes, they can't find no anyone. Yeah, this is a crisis. So Muslims are affected by this as well, I think. Yeah, it's horrible. And I think that it's, um, it's, the, it's, it's the illusion of uh, choice uh, where, where a woman thinks that, okay, you know, not all of the women and some of them are very good in certain communities. Of course, we're not generalizing. However, there is a phenomenon of large swathes of women, especially in the West, that are on these apps and they think they can they can do it. And they stay on these apps for four or five years. And then after that, three, four years, two, three, four, whatever years, and then they realize, wait a minute, we're not getting what we want here. So they end up ha having to settle in their mind, settling. And then their marriages become very bad because they always think what's green on the other side. They always think of what's green on the other side. And a lot of the issue of this, I was just in Qatar and I was speaking to someone and he was saying that we started to have a marriage crisis as well in Qatar. The moment that women started to have money and start working, because they were they're working, women women are working now. So the man has to now be making a lot more money than she is. And he was, I was saying why, and he said it in, in this way. He said, you know, because uh, she's thinking I can, I've got money, he's got money. You know, I can leave him at any time. I can go and do whatever I want. So what, what I don't, what do I need you for? Basically, what do I need you for? She don't, I don't need you for the sexual aspects. I can get it from another man. I can get it from myself. I mean, whatever it is, I, I don't need you for love. Maybe, I don't even love you. You know, you're not getting me don't a house. Don't need you for uh, children either. You have artificial yeah, examination. Exactly. Like even ch children, like, you know, I can, I, can get a, I can get a nanny. I can get a nanny, you know, or something. So what are you bringing to the table? And, you know, on that point, it's interesting. You mentioned Qatar. They're starting to experience this marriage crisis. First of all, one that just goes back to my earlier point, which is the Muslim world is behind us, behind the Western world, in terms of feminism really coming into its form and, you know, 
coming into its prime, so to speak. But also, the, I do know that Zawaj Masyar in the Middle East is a really big thing. It's a big thing. Just You can type online, zawajmasyar.com. They've got whole apps for it already. You think Nostrum's Nikah is new? No, no, it's new in the West. It's already happening in the Middle East. It's very common. And it's something that's in demand as well. In the Middle East specifically, the uh, the Khaliji countries, the Middle Eastern countries, uh, UAE, Saudi, countries like that. A lot of women are <coughs> excuse me, are starting to request this type of marriage. Why? Because it suits <coughs> it suits their lifestyles. She's a working woman, she's prioritizing her career, she doesn't have to wor want to worry about a man full time and so on. <clears throat> and I'm not praising it, by the way, because this is not the best form of, of a marriage union between man and woman. This is not ideal. So I'm not praising it or saying that this is something good or aspirational. I'm just simply saying it's happening. It is happening. You know, like uh, what uh, Eddie Murphy said in that uh, very famous comedy sketch. And he said, uh, what have you done for me lately? You know, what have you done for me lately? Like, what have you done? So there is that. And because the, I feel like this will be more and more of a problem in areas of the world where the standards of living are, are, is higher. It's less and less of a problem where the standards of living are lower. Are lower where women need men. Uh, it's, I know it sounds quite simplistic, but I think that's pretty much what you're going to find. Which is why, from my own personal experience, when I speak to brothers that have been to different countries and I say, and they're looking for multiple wives and stuff like that. I say, where'd you go? They say like, I say, do you go to Egypt? Do you go to like Morocco? Do you go to like Pakistan? Where'd you go? And they say, we go to Morocco, for example, because mm -hmm. the GDP per capita is, uh, it's kind of average for the world, but women in, in, in those particular areas you know, they don't need uh, as much. There's not like in Egypt, for example, you need to you need to get a, it's cultural for you to get a flat for the woman. You get the shabka and the mahra and all this kind of it's a yeah. long story. And you might spend fifty thousand, uh, for example, dollars, maybe hundred thousand dollars to get married to a woman in Egypt because it's seen as like part of the culture. But for Morocco, it's not like that. You go to a village and stuff like that, you can get married very very easy. A lot of Pakistani brothers uh, from up north they've gone to Morocco to get their second and third wives and stuff like this. So uh, why? Because when you offer them for 500 pounds sterling a month, for example, this is a lot of money for them. If you go to uh, one of these countries like Zimbabwe or I don't know, like you, you tell me the country, uh, Malawi, Indonesia, or, Malaysia, Indonesia. Oh, uh, yeah, Malaysia, I've heard. Yes, I've heard that it's very easy to, to do this because it's not the, the barriers to entries are not there. Like, and, and so it's where you find that the woman finds it okay. And it's there's a cultural aspect as well. You go to Nigeria, I think it's very easy to get married to a second wife. For example, you know, <laughs> we're talking. We're talking about the first wife. You're talking about now that you're talking about the second wife or third. No, no, I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I'm bringing this to the table is because, um, like, a w she's willing to be a second wife, even. Like, oh. imagine these. Imagine these women here, like you know, in. Every time I hear an Arab say "even," I can just hear the Arabic word "hatta." It's like it's a, it's a translation. Even, even. One thing I will say <clears throat> is that. The one thing you want to be cautious with, wary about, if you are going to marry a woman from uh, one of the Muslim countries or a country where you feel feminism has not infected it as much as it has the Western world, just be cautious and wary if your intention is to marry her. <coughs> Excuse me. It's fighting the flu like everyone else right now. If your intention is to marry her, and bring her back to the West. And I'll explain to you why. When you marry a Western Muslim woman, she is a known quantity. You know her for what she is. She's born in the West or she's raised in the West. If she's practicing, alhamdulillah, if she's not, she's not. You know what she's like. When you bring a, even a practicing, even, hatta, even, if you bring a practicing Muslim woman from the East or one of these Muslim countries and you bring her over to the West, she is a unknown quantity. She's an unknown quantity. If you're enjoying the stream, make sure you like the video. Barakallahu feekum. You don't know how she's going to react once she is exposed to all of this quote-unquote freedom, quote-unquote liberation. You don't know how she's going to react. So that is the only word of caution I will give you is that if you are thinking to marry one of these women from one of these countries, even if it's Syria or wherever, 
and you want to bring her over to the West, she's an unknown quantity. You don't know how she's going to react. And she may react very badly. She may be like, yo, yeah, women's rights. I want to work. You know, forget this. I'm going to take the home. I can take the home from him. Yo, if I divorce him, I can get his home. Do you understand? Whereas when you're dealing with a Western Muslim woman, okay, she might still have these proclivities and tendencies, but you kind of know what you're getting. And you should know what you're getting into. And you certainly know she's a known quantity because she's been raised here. So just bear that in mind. Just remember that, okay? London. The, the, you, you say second wife. Yes, if she's over 35, 40, 45, she'll consider it. But And she has kids or something like that. She may consider, like, that would be a possibility. But if you filter those apps for women that's 18 to 25 years old, are you looking for polygamy? I guarantee you 99% of them are going to say no chance. Yeah? No in chance. The US, in the US, she can be like 45 years old with five children and she still won't consider polygamy. Really? Say, really? Yeah, yeah. And then you have uh, compassion. All right, before we get to that next segment, I would say, actually, if you're a sister who's in her prime, if you're between the age of 18 to 23, 25 is old, by the way. Yeah, 20, everyone knows, yeah, in the, in the Muslim world, if you if 25 is the expiry date for a woman. And I'm speaking loosely, obviously, with, with uh, satire. It's satire, but there is some truth to that. 25, you are expired. I'm sorry, you are expired. It's old. 25 is old. But if you are between the ages of like 18, 21, 22, <clears throat> then you should only really consider polygyny, frankly speaking, if the brother is a, 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 above average to say the least. Okay? Above average to say the least. Why? Because you're in your prime. All right? And if you're in your prime, it means you can command, you know, a, a pretty good deal for yourself. If you're 18 years old and you're going to marry next brother who's got two wives on housing benefit. And, you know, he wants to take a third wife and you're 18. He's going to put you on housing benefits. Well, brother, that's, that's not a flex, bro. It's really not a flex. So if you are a younger younger woman and you are con considering polygyny, if, if this is the advice I'd give to my own daughters, you want to consider polygyny at that younger age, no problem. He has to be an above average brother to say the least. Why? Because she's in her prime, Yanni. Everyone knows that all 18-year-old women, she pretty much has a pick of the litter. Hence why they're not getting married in the first place, because they have too many options, too many. So if you're going to consider polygyny, then it certainly has to be for a brother who's above average, not just above average. And I'm not just speaking in intangibles with regards to his religion and deen and so on. That's a given. I'm talking socioeconomically. He needs to have any, a good income to be able to take care of you and the other one and comfortably and so on. Above average in his uh, ability to deal with women as well. Some men have got money, but they just don't know how to deal with women. Useless, hopeless, doesn't know how to deal with them. So there's a lot that goes into polygyny, especially if we're talking about conventional marriage. Having multiple wives in the conventional sense, you meaning you're going to take them all on. You're going to provide for them. You intend on having a family with them. This takes a certain level of emotional maturity. Emotional maturity it takes a certain level of mature of emotional maturity to be able to handle that. It's not easy. So you're gonna to have to be above average, bro. Passionate Imam say, men, why aren't you stepping up? We have this amazing Muslim who's 45, no, no, no. Then, 50 yeah. years old. I mean, uh, whatever. I mean, she doesn't need to be in polygamy, but then she might need to go back home. Wherever she like, let's be honest. Like, my advice to her would be, okay, fine, no problem. You don't need to be in polygamy, but where are you from originally? Let's say she's Pakistan, go to Pakistan. No problem. You find many men that want visa there or stuff like that. You know, no, I'm being serious. Like this, this might be the approach. <clears throat> You'd have to. My son want visa <laughs> because no, and you, and and it's, there's a possibility that the 45 year old with five kids can find the man, you know, that's uh, that's willing to marry her as a first wife. Is that that they exist, but it's a very slim possibility. Yeah, the problem is the sense of entitlement that you're talking about. Like they just feel like they're so entitled and they deserve like the best and yeah. Know, and this is this is what happens when you're living when the standards of living are high. It's natural. It ha that's what happens. So, but then if there's not an attitudinal shift, it's going to cause a crisis, and that's what people need to understand. And I I don't want that point to be missed or to be overlooked. Okay, when the standards of living are high, uh, the expectations are greater. And this is a very important point that we can't. Uh, that I don't want you as the audience to gloss over. I want you to pay attention to this. And that is, when the standards of living are higher, they are not perceived as higher. It's still considered as the norm. Uh, uh, it's called a hedonic adaptation. 
the hedonic adaptation when the standards are higher it's no longer considered higher it's the new norm do you really think that if you become a millionaire tomorrow or a billionaire even and you buy a jet and your favorite car and so on that you're going to experience that dopamine rush indefinitely and forever no eventually it's going to come back down and you're going to be feeling normal again just like everyone else some guy living in a two bed flat you be feeling like him <coughs> hedonic adaptation so when the standards of living are higher they're not perceived as higher they can they're perceived as the norm and the irony is it does actually make it harder for man and woman to get married because the expectation in the mind of a woman is even higher than that and that's what we are experiencing here in the west today man if 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 like for example it's not just with women by the way like i was speaking to some brothers i'll be honest with you and they were just like uh, they were like you know I'm, I'm not gonna get married except for this age and this virgin this way let me just address this comment here all right, just this comment. Layla, she says, even at 30, to be honest, if she's got no kids, she's still got plenty of options. She doesn't need to settle for polygyny. All right, there's a lot to unpack here. And that's why I pulled this comment up. Okay. First of all, if she's got no kids, she's still got plenty of options. You may have plenty of options, but if you're still single, it means none of those options have met your requirements or are satisfactory to you which means the guys that you want don't want you i'll prove it if they did want you you'd be married by virtue of the fact that if a woman is at 30 or in and around that age bracket and she's got no kids as in this example that Layla has mentioned by virtue of the fact that she is still single is an indication a proof and evidence that you don't qualify for the man you want because if you did you'd be married which means what you still have no options if i present you with 500 brothers and every single one of them wants to marry you every single one of them says yes and you say no to every single one of them do you know how many options you have none zero you have no options so <clears throat> don't be fooled because if you're turning away these prospective suitors and you see this is where women get this like uh, inflated sense of ego inflated sense of self she starts to think that she's more desirable than than what she is because she's got all of these guys who want to get with her no you only have as many options as you are actually willing to get with yourself that's how many options you have if the guy you want doesn't want you you don't have any options. That's the first thing. The second thing is she doesn't need to settle for polygyny, which means the underlying presumption in this statement right here is that polygyny is an inferior choice to monogamy, meaning it is better to be married to a man and him have just you than it is to be married to a man and him have other wives including you and it's logical to see why a woman would feel this way and the main reason is that his love and by extension his resources would be devoted exclusively to her this is the logical conclusion okay okay well what does allah say in the quran with regards to this discussion when allah talks about marriage he says marry two three or four but if you fear injustice then one which means that the default, the natural state, the superior state is polygyny, two, three or four. So the un this underlying presumption that polygyny is the inferior choice to monogamy, we need to throw this in the bin. This is not true. <clears throat> it is not the preferential choice, actually. And I would say this, I would take that even further. There are, there are positives and negatives to both monogamy and polygyny, both. The, the negatives for a woman in the mind of a woman for being in the polygynous marriage or polygynous relationship are obvious. She's like, oh, I have to share him. I'm not going to see him as much. He's going to divide uh, his resources between multiple women and so on. But you know, there are pros to polygyny that monogamy doesn't have. One of them is you don't have to see him all the time. Ironically, ironically, which means there are days where you don't have to put makeup on your face. You don't have to cook food for him. The house can be a little bit messy. Absolutely fine. 
you get that healthy space and distance between each other. Which means that when he does see you and you do see him, you actually enjoy each other's time. Because you haven't seen each other for a few days or how, however long it is. It depends if you are if you have women in separate households, that is. Some brothers have women in well, multiple women in one house. And even then, still, it creates a healthy level of competition anxiety. And that's a double-edged sword because a lot of women don't like that. I don't wonder if you're like I'm competing with another man. Yes, you should be competing. This is when you are in your healthiest state. You know, women <clears throat> will some women will say, I don't want to be with a man whom many other women find desirable. I want to be with a man whom other women don't find desirable. And the reason why they say this, and this is why a lot of them say they prefer men with dad bods, is because she doesn't feel threatened that other women could steal him from her. It's not that you like the dad bod itself. It's not that you're physically attracted to a dad bod. It's because she doesn't have to deal with the fear that he might, uh, other women could pay interest in him and therefore she would have to share that attention. That's what it boils down to. But here's the thing, sister. If other women don't find him attractive, it means by extension, you will not find him that attractive either. Double-edged sword. When a man is attractive to many women, it means you will be very attracted to him, but he will also have other women on his radar. So don't think that, oh yeah, I found myself the cheat code. No, it don't work like that. Choices and trade-offs. You want a guy who, or a brother who's not very attractive or attractive to other women? No problem. That's absolutely fine. But just understand, you might not be very attracted to him either. You want a brother who's very attractive or is perceived as attractive. And I'm not talking in the physical sense. I'm talking everything. Maybe his status, maybe his wealth, maybe his character, maybe his, his the way he presents himself. Maybe he's a speaker, he's a celebrity, whatever. You want a brother like that? Well, you're going to have to contend and deal with the fact that other women will also find him attractive. Choices and trade-offs like the video. Whatever, like they were giving me their things, and the guys were like, I was like, bro, come on, look at yourself in the mirror. I said, like, <laughs> I said, we're, I was like, you know, let's be honest. If she's if she's a divorcee, if she's this, she's that. No problem, you know. You can still marry her. You, you know, it's not a big pro for, for me. I don't see a big issue with. There's a stigma around divorcees. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, what's the big issue with? Uh, she's been with a man before. Has Matt been to Ones? Uh, 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 Asmat bin Tumais has been with she was she was she was married four times for example she was married to Amr uh, she was married to Abu Bakr Siddiq to Ali ibn Abi Talib to Jafar ibn Abi Talib and I, I forget the fourth and even there were, there was a hadith I don't know the authenticity of it where she, they were kind of joke she they were asked her who was the best husband you had and she said of the shiuch it was Abu Bakr Siddiq and from the shabab it was Jafar ibn Abi Talib and then Ali ibn Abi Talib joked. And said, uh, you've, left, you've left nothing for me, Yani. So this was Asma bin Tumais. So this is a Sahabiya, so a jal, uh, Jalila. She is a very prestigious woman, but she's, uh, you know, divorcee. So we also have a problem from our side, the men, which is that she's divorcee, she's not this, that. I'm going to address this comment by Muhammad uh, in a second, but to my understanding, those companions, most of them, if not all of them, were martyred. <clears throat> Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu an. Or they died during her lifetime, one of the two, which which would make her a widow. Either they were uh, martyred or they died during her lifetime, hence why she moved on. I don't know if any of those were actual divorces per se. I'm going to hold my tongue on that because I don't know. But it would make a, 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 a distinction in the discussion as I have drawn this distinction in the past as well. My, per, my stance with regards to divorces and widows is different. It's different. There's a different stance to take. All right. But we'll get to that in a second. I just want the conversation to, to continue before I put my comment on this. I don't see it like that because I don't think that's the yeah. sorry. I, I don't think that's the criticism of like divorcee or not versus virgin. I think that mm. obviously we have Sahabiyat. Uh, Ataqa is another example. She was you know divorced multiple times. Yeah, uh, and sometimes it was due to the Sahaba she was married to uh, being killed. But yeah. um, she is. She was known for her beauty. She was known for her high lineage. She was known for, you know, her piety. So yeah. it's not. So we have to. We can't compare Ataqa, for example, or some of these Habiyat with a woman who doesn't have those qualities. I think the point about uh, virginity versus being a divorcee is all things being equal. 
right? If you had if two women in every aspect of piety and, and beauty and lineage, they're exactly the same, but one is a virgin and one is a divorcee, you, which one would you pick? Yeah, for me, I don't care. Like, I'll be honest with you. Like me personally, I, the whole thing about that is I've never understood it. But once again, the different strokes for different folks in it. Because mm -hmm. I get the idea that you want a, a virgin. I get that, or some a man would want a virgin. But for me, I mean, this like, is the description of Khor al Ain as well. No man have have yeah. I, I get or that. Seen them. For, if you if it's a personal thing, I don't care to be like, like it's it's no one any whatever. Like you know. It's, uh, it actually it's makes a difference. It makes a difference, like what we promote in the community, because yeah, it's basically okay. I'm gonna provide uh, my uh, comments now here, okay? Because uh, Brother Muhammad said that he doesn't see the, the, the difference, yeah, whether she's a divorcee or not a divorcee. And most people would disagree with this statement. Most people would say no. There's a clear distinction <coughs> and clear difference between a divorcee uh, uh, or a virgin, a, a sister who's never been married before. And whilst I disagree with him uh, fundamentally, my actual, uh, in terms of my own actions myself, I actually don't care myself either. And I'll tell you, I'll explain to you why. And you might think, oh, Matthew, this is an evolution in your, in what you're, you've been speaking about. It absolutely is. And I'll explain to you why. Brother Muhammad, he's already married. Okay. So he has one wife. I don't know how many wives he has, but I know that he's married. So he has one wife. He's been married for many years. Brother Muhammad is also. A brother who he, I'm sure he's not, uh, he doesn't suffer from, what's the word that I'm looking for? I'm sure, I'm sure he is not blind to his innate privileges that he has, but perhaps overlooks them or underestimates them. Okay. Hamd Hijab is extremely intelligent, extremely articulate. He's strong. He's very tall, six foot six. He commands presence and respect. He has status. I don't know what his socioeconomic situation is, but we can assume that he does he does well for himself. He ticks a number of boxes that puts him in a very unique category. He has three master's degrees, one of them from Oxford University. He's currently doing his PhD. Billahi, tell me how many brothers do you know that fit that description? Six foot six, three master's degrees, uh, study, uh, studying his PhD to become a, a doctor. Intelligent, social status. How many brothers do you know like that? This puts you in a level, a playing field, whereby there are so few men that can compete with you that the competition becomes irrelevant. And I sense that in his nonchalant stance. It's like, it's not an issue, divorce, not divorce. Why? Because he's that guy. He's that guy. He is that guy. Another thing, and again, I don't know uh, how many wives Muhammad has or doesn't have, but I can tell you myself, all right? If I want to marry a woman for the purpose of building a family with her, that then my preference will be towards a sister, a virgin sister who's never been married before. Okay? But if I want to marry a woman and there isn't an intention to have a family with her, maybe she is, you know, she's had her kids, she's done that, she doesn't want children herself. Bruv, I don't care, bruv. I really, I couldn't care less. I don't care if she's had a hundred husbands. And, like, like, and there's a number of reasons for this. The obvious reason, or maybe perhaps the non-obvious reason, is that <clears throat> I'm not intending to have a family with her. So the pair bonding thing becomes less important. If I'm going to have children with a woman, then the pair bonding thing is definitely more important because we want to raise these kids in a nuclear home. Not to say just because you've said, oh, we're not going to have kids, that kids can't, might not come. No, it could still come, but... You can get a pulse for these things when you're having a conversation with, with a woman, finding out what her situation is, her age as well, how much life does she have left on her fertility clock, what's her situation. If she's had many kids, believe me, it's very unlikely she's going to want to have more, especially if she's had them from multiple baby daddies. You're going to have to get a pulse in it for yourself. So there's that. And the second reason is that when you've been with a number of women yourself and you have five-star Google review ratings from all of these different women, if you understand what I'm saying, what do you think BDE is? Big D energy. Big D energy doesn't mean that you have a massive member, a big schlong. BD energy comes from consecutive five-star Google review ratings. If I was to marry a woman tomorrow, and she has been married before, and on the off chance, on the, uh, in the unlikely event that after we have been together, we've been intimate for a period of time, that she feels that I'm inferior to another a man who would not exist on this planet 
he would live on Mars somewhere, or maybe he was an alien. And I have come second in my performance to this alien creature. Then you know what? It is what it is. You know, I can't be the best at everything. <laughs> can't be the best at everything, bruv. But the point is this. When you rack up a bit of experience with women and you're getting that feedback and you're collecting those five-star Google reviews and there is a common trend that you see in the feedback and response from those women, this insecurity leaves you. You are no longer worrying about or, or uh, consuming your mind with Am I better than her last ex-husband? Or, you know, was he bigger than me? Did he go on for longer? And these are, I shouldn't talk about it mockingly, to be honest with you, because these are natural insecurities that a man has when he doesn't have experience with a woman. When he hasn't been with women, he's naturally going to be thinking about these things. BDE, that term, that street term, big D energy, and you know what I'm referring to, comes from that consecutive five star google review ratings with many different excuse me alhamdulillah with many different women from many different backgrounds and you're like you know what if there's some guy on mars who's who's who was better than me one of her khalas yani, it is what it is you just, you just don't care and you know i sense that energy from muhammad but i i want him to be aware of this that for the regular joe for the regular everyday man whether he has one wife He's been married once or he's not been married before, which is the case for a lot of men. Being the idea of getting with a divorcee, a woman who's been married before, is a point of great insecurity for him. This makes him really feel some type of way. He's like, he's really worried. Am I going to be able to match up, level up and, and, and you know, meet the, the standard, whatever that standard was, of her previous experiences? So this is absolutely an issue. This is an absolute. This is absolutely an issue. Okay, let's continue. Basically, is a stigma. I think that this is what I've said before. Like, mm -hmm. yes, given our context, we actually mm -hmm. need a stigma against divorce in order to prevent women mm -hmm. from leaving their marriages. Because right now we have a crisis. Uh, yeah, well, women like initiate leaving. more, right? Yeah, they're initiating divorce. They're leaving their marriages. So actually, the stigma is a good thing. Like, <laughs> against yeah, but the issue rate. with that then is that if you have divorced women, which is going to be a big portion of the population, they need to get remarried either in polygamy or in monogamy. Yeah. So if you have a stigma, then well, we're trying get... to reduce. We're trying to reduce the numbers precisely by stigmatizing divorce. And women are very sensitive, actually, to social stigmas. And if they re recognize that there's stigma, there's that's one more thing that's preventing them from leaving the marriage and breaking up the family. I think it is the family. I, I get what you're saying. Feminist. I get what you're saying. But then it, we have to see proof of concept. Like what's, uh, what's worse, creating a stigma, which creates a problem in itself, which is the problem of, well, like now she is going to find it harder to get remarried because of the it stigma. Won't, it, won't. Affected... it won't though. That's the thing. Like, Do you think men so? Are, yeah. Men are willing to marry, you know, <laughs> the men are, there are so many men dying to get married at this point, actually. I don't think mm. it's a stigma that will negatively affect their chances of getting. Do you know, married. one of my friends sent me something which I want to share with you. It's uh, very good, actually. I let that run because uh, Brother Daniel, mashallah, addressed that uh, excellently. I am. I also agree with Brother Daniel on this point, which is uh, stigmas are healthy. They can obviously be taken to the extreme, which is often what happens with stigmas. But fundamentally, a stigma exists for a reason. OK, I have likened the issue of divorce to the issue of being fired from a workplace. All right. Man or woman, by the way, man or woman. But I speak specifically about women because they are the ones initiating the majority of the divorces. If you were fired from your previous job and I'm an employer looking to employ you, I want to know why you were fired. I want to know why. It doesn't mean I won't employ you. It doesn't mean I won't marry you. But it does mean that I want to understand what happened, what went wrong. Were you in the wrong? Were they on the wrong? Is there a problem with you? Have you been fired from multiple workplaces? Now, definitely, I will think there's a problem with you specifically. If you have been fired, okay, from five jobs back to back to back to back to back, there's one common denominator here. You.
If a woman has been in five failed marriages, not a widow, okay? Not her husband died, no. She got divorced back to back to back to back to back. There is only one common denominator here, her. Let's say there's a sister who comes and she's been divorced five times. I know of a sister, by the way, who's been married 10 times. Wallah al she's my age. 10 times, I kid you not. She has been married in halal 10 times. Are you telling me now that you think you're going to come along as the 11th brother, mashallah, to reform and fix this woman? Really? I don't think so, bro. I would not recommend you having a family with her. No strings, nikah, strictly. Strictly. 10 previous husband, strictly root boy. Do you understand? Option option two or three. Some of the strings or none of the strings for that matter. Miss Yard, Zawaj Miss Yard. But to settle down with this woman and have a family with her, that's a massive liability. In the same way, it would be a massive liability for me to hire someone who has just been fired 10 times consecutively. From 10 consecutive jobs, he's been fired. And then I'm going to go and hire him on. I'm going to be, mashallah, the douchebag donor to bring my guy on, thinking that my job, my company, me as the CEO, I'm going to reform him. No, thank you. No, thank you. Absolutely not. Um, it was, I think, the what, the only thing that I saw of its kind, um, which was like a medieval, uh, it was a medieval thing, a survey, okay, which which examined divorce in a medieval period. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, here we go. So this is what it says. Um, Shamsuddin Muhammad ibn Abdul Rahman al-Sakhawi yeah, was a reputable Shafi'i Muslim Hadith scholar and historian who was born in Cairo. Uh, um, uh, Sakha is a village in Egypt where his relatives belonged. He was a prolific writer and excelled. Okay, for, so he looked at his work was also, also anthropological. Yeah, For example, in Egypt, he recorded the marital history of 500 women. The largest the largest sample of marriage in the Middle Ages and found that at least a third of all women in the Mamluk Sultan, Sultan of Egypt and the Bilad al-Sham married more than once, one third of all women, with many women marrying three or more times. According to a Sahawi, many, uh, as many as three out of ten marriages in the 15th century uh, ended in divorce. Yeah? Um, what percentage? What, sorry. This is... Uh, do you want to know the... the shall I send you the stuff? No, no, which percentage ended in divorce? I missed that part. Uh, so he said that he, um, he said as many as three out of 10. So like 30%. 30%. Hmm. In, so it's, it's less than the U- US average, I think. Ended in divorce. He said proficiency. In it. So the point is, is that, do you know this idea of, let's say, I, I might have a different uh, approach. Maybe it was, maybe my approach is a bit too laissez faire. But my thing is, let's say divorce happens. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, if divorce happens, it's not the worst thing in the world. I do get, do you get what I'm saying? Like, uh, f- so long as remarriage happens, you, I feel like if we're more laissez faire with this thing, if but the, it, f- why is the divorce happening? I think that is very critical because if you're saying mm-hmm. that 30% of the women uh, are in multiple marriages or they're getting divorced in that Mamluk period or the Middle Ages because their husbands are getting killed in jihad. Their husbands mm-hmm. are, you know, dying be- for, because of work or because the men, you know, are divorcing them and, you know, getting remarried and the women are able to re- remarry, etc. Unfortunately, our yeah. context today is very far from that context That's where the divorce, the divorce now is women driven and it's be- due to Exactly, you know what you mentioned, the entitlement that I can get better, I, can, I deserve more. This man, you know, he's, you know, uh, six, four, he's, you know, very successful financially, he's very eloquent and strong, but I can get better, I can do better than him. And we see this with the, the divorces of high celebrities. Like- and this is absolutely right. And this is why I believe, especially in the context of this day and age, that divorce should be stigmatized. There should be a stigma attached to it. If I'm not mistaken, I believe 90% of all divorces, I'm sorry, no, it's 70 to 80%. 70 to 80% of all divorces initiated in the West, in the West, 
are initiated by women and a large majority of those divorces the reason for said divorce is what no fault divorce which is i don't have a reason he didn't cheat on me he wasn't <clears throat> bad to me he didn't oppress me we just drifted apart we kind of went our separate ways no fault divorce no fault divorce so Already as it is, and I believe that they have covered it or they're about to cover it, that a woman has a natural proclivity towards ingratitude, yakfurun al khayrat, towards her husband. You can do a lifetime of good towards her and she'll say to you, what did you do for me? What have you? This is a woman, speaking generally, her natural proclivity as described by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa That's her natural proclivity and tendency. You couple that with the fact that we live in a comfortable society here in the West. Okay, things are comfortable, easy, standard of living is higher, therefore the expectation in her mind from what a man should bring to the table is even higher than that. Couple that with her innate natural ingratitude towards what you do for her. We are going to be in the situation that we find ourselves in. Women asking to leave the marriage for weak reasons. And in the context of this situation that we find ourselves in now here in the West, stigma on divorce is necessary. During this Mamluk period that they are referring to, as Brother Daniel, you know, uh, excellently pointed out, we don't know what the reasons for those, the, the marriages falling apart were, but certainly there were many wars during that period and a lot of those women would have been widowed, would have been widowed. So a lot of the reason as to why those women would have had two plus husbands is because her husbands are dying. They're dying on her. So completely different uh, context, different time period, different situation. Certainly for this, if I'm going to look at a woman, and this is how I, this is how I strongly recommend you brothers, when you're looking at a woman, you need to look, you need to understand there are two different types of women that you can marry. There's a woman that you can marry and you want to have a family with her. And there's a woman that you can marry and you just want it to be halal with her. As to how many strings are involved in that, that's your decision to make. And as to how you are going to about, go, going to go about taking prevent, preventative measures of having children, you're going to have to decide that as well. All right, you will typically find women who agree to this don't actually want more kids. She's got three, four, five, six, seven children already from two plus baby daddies, and she don't want to be to have a third baby daddy. So it's it's typically coming from her anyway. But you need to understand there's two types of women. You've got the woman that you want to have a family with, and you've got a woman where you want it to be halal with. All right. According to what type of woman you want to marry will dictate what uh, what type of emotional investment financial investment and time investment you're going to give to her if you want her to be the mother of your children this is a, you need to look at this from a different eye to a woman who you just want to enjoy time with her in halal every now and then horses for courses like all of the richest men in the world their women have, their wives have left them have divorced them or there's the example of one of the greatest uh, American football players, Tom Brady, his wife of over a decade divorced him because she thought that, OK, he's not really, you know, giving me what I need as, as his wife. And he's he's, you know, has all the dunya we characteristics that a woman could want. And even he is not good enough for her. So this just speaks to this sense of entitlement that is driving the divorce rate. And it's also driving um, men not being able to find. Uh, women for long-term relationships such as marriage yeah i think the entitlement thing is is huge and um especially with hypergamy and especially when you when you talk about standards of living being an unprecedented high in terms of women uh their ability to kind of make my, their own money all those things are fitna for women. that woman has to see all those things as a fitna it's a fitna because you know at the end of the day uh we all think what can we what can we get that's better in life we all think that the thought crosses our mind but this is why shukr is very important. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he warned us, especially women, he's, he warned women about the issue of gratitude, very uh, very sternly, in fact. Uh, for example, the hadith of in ahsanta ilayhinna dhahra kullahu qulna ma ahsanta ilayhi khayran qat. That if you were so nice to them, all of if you were very excellent with them in your behavior, uh, all of, for eternity, the whole of time, they will say that you have never been good to me. So the Prophet ﷺ is giving you the generalizing behavior. Uh, for example, the issue of uh, of, of, of not being grateful. That's what it really stems from. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran 
is wala in shakartum la azidannakum if you thank allah will give you more so we have to train ourselves and train our women and our wives and our children uh, the issue of gratitude so for example what i do is uh, you know with my family i mentioned these verses obviously and in these kind of things but we also have a game so again not to gloss over that point that women have a natural bent towards ingratitude a natural bent however that bent can be fettered can be placed under arrest a lot more easily when she's dependent upon you and she's dependent upon you however when you're living in a generation of women whom are strong and independent quote unquote she's no longer as dependent upon you this natural proclivity towards ingratitude is heightened it's more prone to show it to rear its ugly head why because she doesn't need you for as much when she needs you for more she's less likely to express this type of sentiment but when she doesn't need you this sentiment is more likely to surface and to express itself speaking in broad strokes of course speaking in broad terms and a lot of women have a problem with this idea of being dependent upon a man and it's true in the hands of the wrong man or a, an oppressor a tyrant a man who doesn't who has bad intentions to her her being solely rely, reliant upon him puts her in a vulnerable position i understand why women have uh, wanted to detach themselves from this because dependence puts you in a position of weakness it does and this is where it is the role and responsibility of a man to take that responsibility seriously and to want to look at you to look after his woman unfortunately i know a, a number of stories of men who just refuse categorically to take care of their own children i know two instances that come to my head two instances that i have dealt with over the years that come to my mind right now interestingly from a very specific community as well i'm not going to mention the community both of these two men refuse to see or spend on their kids unless he can get back with his ex-wife they're divorced now and they both have both explicitly said if i can't have you back i don't want to see the kids i don't want nothing to do with them i ain't taking them out i ain't spending on them haiwan you dog you animal i know i know i know of two instances like this i know of these men i don't know them personally but i know of them i know who they are if i saw them on the street i'd recognize them you dog you haiwan if I can't have my ex, I don't want to see my kids. Yeah, haywan. And then you then you wonder why women want to become in the, strong and independent, or at least independent, at least because she put herself in this vulnerable situation and it backfired. So it's a position of responsibility that, that needs to be taken seriously, that needs to be respected and taken seriously. If you want women to come back to that, then uh, us as men, we need to take this responsibility seriously. Where we sit down, your kids are there, and everyone. I say, let's see who can write down the things that you're grateful for, and let's see whoever writes down the most wins. Or, or you have, we'll do rapid fire, and whoever doesn't mention something will lose, we'll get kicked out. And you know, you're surprised because my young children are so innocent and pure. They'll mention things which are subhanallah, like that I wouldn't even think about because they they think about things which are we would consider to be taken for granted. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, you know, when to add the Allah, let us uh, if you keep uh, he gave you from everything you asked, and if you are uh, and if you counted the ni'am of Allah, the blessings of Allah, you will not be able to enumerate them. So, this idea of trying though, trying it, sitting down on a daily basis and making it a habit in the family, in the Muslim family home, where the, everyone is sitting down, uh, making tasbih, for example, uh, alhamdulillah thinking about the ni'am of Allah think it like it has to be a staple part of the Muslim nutri spiritual nutritional diet uh, because the reason why entitlement comes is because of two things kibr and kufr uh, kufr and ni'mah kibr arrogance I'm better than uh, this this situation I'm I deserve more basically I, I said to one person before they said I deserve more I said okay well like what do you mean by I deserve more I said, do you mean it in a cosmological sense or do you mean it in a in a shari sense? And they said, I deserve more. I said, if I went to a hospital with you and you saw a child with blind child with no limbs, what would you say? And would you say they deserve more or not? Like Allah gives you exactly what you deserve in one sense. 
but then he recompensates you in another sense. So this idea of deserving more, we have to try and um, yeah, and you think about this properly because it's, I think it is. This is the the, the the root of the problem is actually a spiritual, psycho spiritual problem. Is adamu uh, adamu shukr? It's the lack of shukr because we don't maybe we don't have a culture of shukr enough. We have a culture of entitlement. We have a, a culture of ingratitude. So if we ch if we transform the culture for men, women, and children, and we say, look, let's have a culture now of let's be grateful, and I will say brazenly especially for women because the prophet ﷺ gave us a special advice for the wife uh, you have a tendency to it now you might say this is actually very misogynistic we say now like even one thing about jordan peterson which is good is that he brought this a big five personality and before i let that continue i just want to grab these super chats dude this is out to you actually appreciate it Prophet uh, also didn't specify bad women in the hadith, but said women in general. Yes, absolutely. This is a proclivity and a tendency of ingratitude that is inherent upon women in general. And actually, Muhammad, uh, Muhammad's about to explain why, off the back, uh, from a scientific perspective, if you like, why or one of the reasons why this could be the case. Okay, he's about to get to right, get to it right now. I've actually heard Jordan Peterson speak about this before. I'll run the clip in, in a second. Zakallah for the second super chat, dude, uh, dude Desi Abdul Hamid. As men, we need to be on the right path first. Women will then follow. Yes, but you see this statement of uh, you know man up, take more responsibility, and so on. I whilst I agree with it, part of manning up and taking more resp responsibility, as I'm sure you will agree, Abdul Hamid. I already know you know this stuff. But part of that for the rest of you is knowing when to tell a woman no. Is knowing when to put your foot in the proverbial throat. Do you understand? It's knowing when to draw the line. It's knowing when to not listen to her. All of that is part of taking responsibility and manning up. What we've done is we're taking all the responsibility without an equal amount of authority. Authority, key word. Responsibility, 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 but I have no authority. You're a slave. There's no difference between you and the slaves in the plantations in America hundreds of years ago. You're a slave. You have all the responsibility of running the plantation, none of the authority. You are a slave. So whilst I agree that men need to be men for men and man up and so on, part of being a man is putting your foot in the proverbial throat and keeping it there. I find a healthy level of pressure on the throat of your, of your women Metaphorically speaking, of course, is good for the relationship. You take your foot off too much, and you, you are a bit too lenient, that's when things go south. You're like, yeah, you constantly have to keep on top of it. And you constantly have to keep on top of it. You've got to keep your foot there. She needs to know that there's a line and the foot is still there. Just because it's gotten easier to breathe doesn't mean the foot's not there. No, the foot is there. And every now and again, you need to apply a bit more pressure on the foot. To constrict that metaphorical air just to remind her and give her a wake-up call of who she's dealing with. And all of it is from compassion and love, by the way, okay? It's not coming from a vindictive, uh, malicious uh, stance. It's, it's all from compassion and love, but part of loving and being compassionate is being cruel to be kind. Sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind. ...traits and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And he said that one thing which unites women, or which is a more um, cross-cultural, and I saw some peer-reviewed studies on it as well, and which is uh, known, is that women are more likely to be to have trait neuroticism. This idea of thinking things are bad, or you know, having feelings of unpleasant feelings of anxiety, and these kind of things. And trait neuroticism and ingratitude are inextricably linked, because you can't be neurotic and optimistic at the same time. Someone who is neurotic is lacking in the optimistic, a grateful, um, you know, demeanor. And so if we are able to reduce psychological neuroticism, which is more prominent and more clear as per the psychological studies that we have on the big five, for example, and increase gratitude and increase uh, or humbleness. Whoever humbles himself to Allah, Allah raises them. And I think that this is actually the solution to the like one of the spiritual solutions to the marriage crisis, that people need to just be grateful for what they have. And if you are given something, if if, uh, if someone comes to you as an opportunity as a man, a good man, and he comes to a woman and says, "Listen, I don't have that much money, or I make a reasonable amount. I try my best." 
However, I've you know I believe in this. I'm a principled man. This guy is gonna is yani to, for you to turn him down because you don't want to settle with him. You'll you'll you will feel the brunt of you will feel the pain of that in three years time when now, quite frankly, you're not as you used to be and uh, and you're still searching and you would have you you will regret that. Well, I think a woman will regret the fact that she shouldn't go with this guy and now he's with another woman walking the street with a baby in the pram, walking happy uh, happily ever after. She'll be very regretful of that. Because of that kibble that she had, or that that entitlement, and so on, it's a it's something which you need to stamp out. Yeah, I think um, very beautifully said about the importance of shukr and how we really need this spiritual value in our life. I think that also there are certain kinds of structural features of Islam that uh, generate shukr or put you in a in a position of dependence where you can be more thankful and you can be more dependent, especially as a woman. So one of the things that I advocate, for example, in my dawah is that it's better if you don't need to work, you know, women should not work. Women should, you know, remain in the home as much as you can. And this is going to create a dependence because you have to be thankful as a woman. Uh, Islam creates that necessity that you have on your husband and that necessity that you have for your husband to provide for you and protect you. That will generate naturally, psychologically, feelings of shukr, feelings of gratitude to Allah, to your husband. And that just strengthens the marital bond so you're less likely to leave. Whereas if you are you know, making your own money, sometimes women are making more than their husbands increasingly because of whatever uh, pro-women hiring policies and promotion policies in the workplace nowadays, uh, they they're making more than their husband. So what, as you said earlier, what value am I getting from this man in my life? Uh, I, I'm better without him or I can do better. Whereas that situation can be entirely avoided and marriages can be stronger. Families can be stronger if we just had a policy or we just taught this value that, yeah, don't encourage your daughters to go work. Don't encourage your daughters to go become these high powered working women who can then because they're, it's ultimately better for the community, of course, because you have more stronger marriages and families. But it's also better for the women themselves, you know, because they, what is ultimately going to bring more happiness in a purely dunya sense, but also in terms of akhira, having a strong, happy marriage, raising children, raising strong believers, or, you know, being a, you know, successful PhD business woman or uh, corporate executive, which one ultimately is going to have more value for the woman herself, let alone for the community or for the ummah? Yeah, brother Dan is absolutely based, Allah Mubarak, absolutely based. <clears throat> the only thing I will add to that is that whilst I would definitely promote and encourage this, it is going uh, by this I mean women staying at home and men being the sole providers. We are going to go through a process, a, a teething process to get there. And the reason why I say that is in the West, it is very difficult for the average family to survive on one income. Very difficult. Most fam average families now in the West are not, you don't have two people going to work because it's a nice luxury. You've got two mom and dad going to work because it's damn near a necessity. The value of labor halved the moment women entered the workforce. It's a simple case of supply and demand. You can't flood the workforce with labor it doesn't want. If I'm an employer and I only need two people to do said job, but you're forcing me to take four, I'll be like, okay, fine, I'll take all four of them, but I'm gonna pay, I'm gonna pay the first two half and give that half to the other two that you're forcing me to take on. And that is what happened when women began to enter the workforce en masse. Is that the value of labor halved? How is it that just 60 years ago it was very easy for a man to be able to take care of his family comfortably, comfortably? The average man that is whilst his wife was a stay-at-home housewife and yet now today you've got mom and dad both working two salaries coming in and still scraping the barrel what what's going on there the value of labor has halved and then of course there are other factors inflation and so on cost of living has shot up uh gone through the roof uh out of it's out of sync with the the rise in wages and so on so those are the, the those are those factors are also there. 
Point is this, we are going to be going for a teething period And this is why I don't mock brothers whose wives work I don't, wallahi, I don't mock them If it is from a, uh, a stance of necessity If it is from a stance of necessity Because I'm sure a lot of those brothers would love to, to just His wife to just stay at home But, you know, he finds himself in that situation And ask Allah to make it easy for you, man and you know you're gonna to want to start getting on them side hustles, bro. That that internet money, that e-commerce money. Figure out something, bro, because it's all long. Yeah, you really the last place you want your woman is in the workplace, or mixing with other men. Believe me, and it's the last place you want your woman. A horror story. I could the stories I could tell you. You take your wife out of work tomorrow. So may Allah make it easy for you. I think that's exactly right. And you know, at the end of the day, um, this that last point you mentioned, I think, is very. I've been experimenting with that uh, angle of it, which is that to let women know that actually this is in their own best interest. You know, I just want to put up this comment here from this uh, this sister. She says, sisters, listen up. Sometimes we need the miswork. You know, women know deep down, it's very rare that she'll actually say it like this. And by the way, there's 252 of you in here, and I don't know how many likes, but do your boy a solid. Make sure you like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. <laughs> Sisters know deep down that they, women in general, not just sisters, women know deep down that the foot on the throat treatment is the best treatment for them. It's the best treatment for them. They don't like to admit this because it's like what you're trying to say, I'm a child. Yes, Habibti, I love you. I think you're wonderful, but you are a big child. You hit 16 and you never moved on from there, mentally, psychologically speaking, em emotional maturity, maybe 18. And you just got stuck there in time. So maybe, you go, I feel young. Yeah, you are young in your brain. Your brain's young. <laughs> and this is the case, yeah. And the, the emotional maturity of a woman is, or the, and the mental mature, her mental maturity is capped at a lower level than that of a man. So just as you would do with a child, sometimes you have to implement some type of punitive punishment. I don't mean get the whip out and actually smack. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, and you have to deal with them like children sometimes. And I say that with love. I really, I say that with love. And I think that's, that's a really good way of putting it because at the end of the day, all the studies that we've had, and I've done a lecture on this in um, Belgium, uh, which is on the Sapiens uh, YouTube channel, like where I say that how feminism has harmed women by telling them that if you get this stuff, if you do this, live this life, it will make you more happy. But all of the studies that we've seen have shown categorically that women, because of these changes, or after these changes have been made, have shown to be more psychologically fatigued they have nervous breakdowns they have lower life satisfaction the biggest study uh blanche flower and oswald for example you know which was done over tens of years uh, concluded that and so you know at, at the end of the day there's a reason and this is i think one really good part of your da'wah where you show that the rules of islam um not only benefit the individual but they benefit the family the society uh, you know and the whole unit and so it's, it's amazing how when people go away from that and they experiment with everything else, it really destroys their life. The studies that we have on LGBTQ families and two families, two men from the same family, two women from the same family and a, a child, all of that shows categorically that it's more disadvantageous for everybody. Like sometimes it can be, that's a benefit that comes from, from them implementing these policies. That we can see how, fa how much of a failed uh, policies they are. And subhanAllah, I was thinking as well, one great benefit of LGBTQ, I would, I'd never thought I'd be <laughs> like, like this. They're just going to clip that. They're going to say. <laughs> one great <laughs> benefit of it is that it's, it's, it's a really powerful way for them to destroy their own civilization from within. Because if you think about it, like the Western civilization is really powerful, right? You know, uh, Western Europe and its extension, ex extensions. It, it's really powerful in that sense. And you think to yourself, how can a civilization or a country like the United States of America, which has a military bud a budget, which is more than the 13 mo uh, 10 most countries uh, or 13 most countries combined, how can a civilization like this with Hollywood and all this, kind of, how can it be, how can there be a competitor to this civilization? And you think to yourself, who's going to beat it? Is it going to be Russia? Is it going to be China? Is it going to be the Middle East? Is it the Muslim world? And all of them, in many ways, you can see how a case can be made, economic case in the case of China, military case in the case of Russia. But it's not really convincing. What's more convincing to me is that the Western civilization, with LGBTQ, with all of these things that they have, 
is most likely to destroy itself very quickly. Because, I mean, I'm not sure if you saw this video recently. It's very funny, actually. It was like a, you've got the Russian army. They're doing like these drills and stuff like that. The Russian army, yeah, the military. And then it's just that these men, they're going like obstacle courses, shooting, go, you know. And then they juxtaposed it with the American one. And it was a woman who started off as like a lesbian. She was like, you know, I always wanted to go to ends of man. I, you know, I don't know what it was, yeah? It's like LGBTQ guy. And I was thinking to myself, like, you know, at the end of the day, if this is the, the, the if these are the guys you're going to put on the front line, I mean, an enemy to the Western civilization, that is a dream for them. To see you put these guys on the front line. To, to women, in the UK, for example, women were not allowed on the front line. Only recently they changed the law that can now put women on the front line. If now these guys, whoever you are going to be facing next, you can see women in the front line and this lesbian here and that woman there and stuff like that. This is like, you're, it's a gift. You're gifting them. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, at the end of the day, do you really think that they can do what these guys in World War II did for you? There's no chance. If, the, if your armies and militaries are composed of that, we would have a world now which is dominated by Nazi-speaking, uh, uh, Nazis, actually. We'd have a completely different world. <laughs> so the, that, that, the, the point is, is that... Absolutely right. I've, I've touched upon this myself in the past, that most likely the way that the West will unravel is not through any foreign power or anything like this, but through their own uh, indulgence in sexual degeneracy and decadence. Sexual decadence or decadence in general for that matter most probably will implode upon itself i'm just having a look at the timestamps here there's a part here that i haven't seen let's play this breakfast in bed and other marriage advice but he brings when i watched that series i'll be honest i changed my perspective on a few things because he started providing references that i didn't know and um I had to kind of soften my view. I, I had I had a pretty stringent view in the beginning as well. If you ask my wife in the first two, three years of marriage, how I was with her, <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> you know, it was all the, I, I can say this, like most, those guys, the selfies and that, they, they, I was worse than them, yeah. But in the, in the, then I started to really loosen up because I started to be um, kind of, Look at other scholars, what they say in the world and stuff like that. The Maliki scholars, the Mauritanian scholars. I'll be honest, I had to change a couple of, a few of my views on the, on the matter. I have to. Can you be specific? Like, give us an example. <sighs> okay, yeah, I'll give you one example. Like, I, I wouldn't, I would say to my wife, you can't go out at night, for example. Yeah. And for us, mm -hmm. we have nighttime starts at four o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's problematic. You know, you got universities and stuff like that. And, um, <clears throat> Four o'clock is is a short day, mm. so and then yeah, and the, um, other things like other things which I was very 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 strict with, which I've become less strict. I'll be honest with music. Now I'm not saying I believe in music is true, uh, is is halal. I'm I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying that, for example, if I'm listening to something in the background and there's a bit of a jingle or something like that, I'd go to other place. Uh, like if I was in a supermarket, I wouldn't want to be there. I'd move them myself. I'm not saying that's wrong. That's what I know that. But then I realized, for example, there's a difference between a sama and a mustama. Like, and even Ibn Qudama, I mentioned in Mughni, there's a big difference between a sama. And actually, I think he says a jahil doesn't know the difference between a sama and a mustama. A sama is someone who just hears something. A mustama is someone who's listening to it. Yeah. So it, the mess of hearing something, I can't just stop myself from moving and stuff. And this was a big, big issue because any any device that would come into my house, which produced a, a jingle or musical sound, I would destroy the device. Even my daughter remind, reminds me one time because they brought in like a like a device one time and I destroyed it. And she goes, remember that time you broke that thing? I was like, yeah, I broke it. And that. But that was back in the days. Now I wouldn't do this thing, you know, because I think that's too much. And especially, you know, considering considering the distinction that I've just made, you, you learn in it. Like I, I didn't know those distinctions. I was very, if you like, literalistic in the beginning and very rough. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, this is why I wanted you to give examples because when you say just a broad statement, like, Oh, I've softened my stances or something okay, like yeah, that. Yeah. People, people's minds will jump and they'll That's say, Oh, this it, yeah. <laughs> what does, how has he moved? But these things that you're mentioning, like, I wouldn't call, I wouldn't consider them a big shift or look at the kinds of shifts that we see in 
among yeah. some Muslims in America, which is a completely con different context. Oh, I, oh, I get your point. No, <laughs> no, I, I think with, with that is like, it does actually change your day-to-day -day life quite a lot because imagine like it, 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 there are certain things that could not even be in my house. You know, it, it, so it's kind of like, it's not Amish or way of living, but it's, there's certain real strict routines that I had that I, I thought. But then when you start, I started listening to different scholars from all around the world and doing usul fiqh and things started to change for me, I'll be honest, in, in a way which is I was, I was very rigid. No, you know? even, even the point that you're making about music in the background, there is no, I don't know of any stores that like department stores um, that sell basic life goods that you need that don't have music like playing in the on the stereo in the background at least in america so yeah, you exactly. have to cut yourself off from it would become so much of a difficulty you know for the average believer if if anywhere that music is playing you can't go then you basically can't be in public because it's so prevalent uh throughout um department stores even airports you can't go to the airport they're playing it in the background yeah, but then I, I was thinking things to myself like, well, you can put a headphone in and play it when you get into the department store. Stuff like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I already had all that. Thought, I had I thought about all of that. In it. But then this whole thing about Sam and Mustang, I really helped me out, like, I'll be honest. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, these are just some examples, but like of how I used to be quite strict. I used to be quite strict in the house. And, uh, you know, I used to have a routine for my wife, which I would tick it off like a, you know, a report card for the schools. <laughs> now, honestly, I, you know, I'd invite her to do the same thing for me. I say to her, like, you, you know, this process is quite normal, by the way. <clears throat> this process is quite normal, especially when you first enter the religion. You, you, you're you very enthusiastic. I remember when I first started practicing, 16 years old, you're very enthusiastic. Then you can make the religion hard upon yourself. And there's a hadith of the Prophet, whereby he says, Nobody makes the religion hard upon himself except that it breaks him. Except that it breaks him. Now that's not to say that's not to say that we we become so lenient to the point where you know we're making concessions left and right. But what the, these are simple things that even I can relate to from my childhood. I was far when I say childhood, I guess I would be considered the child, but I was a child with kids. You know, I had my first kid at seventeen. I had three kids by nineteen. That's what I mean by childhood. So there are things that I was far more strict on, far more strict on when I was younger that you, you start to become more fluid as you grow older, so to speak. Very, very rigid before, to the point where it can become oppressive. Nobody makes the religion hard upon themselves, except that the religion, it will break him. It will break him. You can do the same thing for me, but I'd have a report card and for her and stuff like that and rate her performances in different areas, and she would do the same thing for me. And it was actually quite a good thing. <laughs> because it helped me to, you know, progress a certain level and help her to be a certain way. Actually, uh, for example, Fajr. I was, if you ask my wife how I was with Fajr in the in the beginning of the marriage, it was actually comical, actually, hmm. yeah, because, you know, you can you can you can wait until shuruq. Obviously, you shouldn't, but I would be very like if she didn't wake up straight away, I'd open the door, open the light, open the window, and the wind the wind would come in. I start shouting. I start doing adhan loudly. <laughs> so, 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 yani. I'm giving you an example of of something that I I used to do, like which I wouldn't I wouldn't do that now, yani. I wouldn't I would do it in a different way, but I still I wake up I do it, yani. But uh, one one big uh, thing was about service, like obedience, and I was a different level of guy. I, I've had to reduce my stances there. Uh, still do have it like that, but it's not. I'm not as service? bad. Service? As what do you mean, service? So, for example, I I had you know I, um, I, I the, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so for example, like you know the you know like certain things had to be breakfast times, you know <laughs> breakfast times, yeah, like breakfast times stuff like that. You know, I had to have the breakfast sometimes. So that was a big. Uh, uh, struggle in the beginning, like to, for me to get my breakfast on time and stuff, because I, I <laughs> <laughs> there's a certain time I had to get the breakfast, I guess, let's say. And uh, yeah, I, mean, I have mean, a very good system now. I, I realized before that I was very, uh, very staunch. And yeah, I mean, you're I'm inspiring, gonna... you're inspiring the brothers, mashallah. You're like, oh, okay, 
<laughs> we need to have a report card for our wives. No, but she, I, I, ready I at a certain time. Her, lunch, she wants to send the report card to me. I'm more than welcome. <laughs> I'm more than welcome. You know. She sends a report card about, about you. you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a normal part of aging, I think. Uh, the mellowing out of, of one's character. I think in the beginning, it's more, it comes with hikmah, with wisdom, which is, okay, and I was being a bit too much of a, a bit too literal in my interpretation of things. Uh, but eventually, like I see with my own father, for example, as my father has, has gotten older and aged and has indeed become sick for that matter, <laughs> my kids get away with murder. With my parents, especially with my father, than what me and my sisters got away. Well, we didn't get away with anything, for that matter. In fact, even between me and my oldest sister, who's younger than me, and then the two younger sister, partic sisters, particularly the youngest sister, there was a difference in our upbringing in terms of the strictness that my father imposed upon us. Like there's a, a definite difference between the first two children and the last two children. A definite difference, and that's just part of aging the aging process mellowing out but eventually it gets to a point as well like the lion is getting old he no longer has the energy to uh impose his will in that way as is the case you know when i, like I see with my own father i'm not saying this is the case for muhammad this is man has, hasn't even entered his prime yet in muhammad's case and certainly in my case as well it's just simply a case of wisdom you begin to uh, become less literal in your interpretation of things and you become a bit more wise. But eventually, it's, it's definitely connected to aging as well. Like, you don't have as much of a will to fight. Life grates on you. It wears on you. Like a tire, the tire wears thin. All right. Samad, appreciate you, uh, appreciate you, my man. How do we make the religion easy for us? This is a, a question you need to ask. An alam, it's not for me. Barakallahu uh, feek. I'm not uh, not qualified to answer this. All right, let's continue. <laughs> she, she, like, for example, I would say to her, like, name three things about me that you want to see me change. And I'll name three things about you that I want to see you change. And I'll rate you on the basis of that. And I, you rate me on the basis of that on a daily basis. Hmm. And so now I have, uh, I got married in 2011. I have report cards on my email because it was all electronic from 2011 so if there's anything that happens like a, a but i think that's what you know uh i think this has helped my marriage i'll be honest with you because it's it's just set expectations and boundaries with the wife you know and she's done the same things with me like oh she's there's something she doesn't like about my behavior and i'll be honest with you i feel like she's helped me grow into a better person by saying telling me this is kind of odd behavior i don't like you to do this i don't need that but from my side, yes, there are certain things on the uh, report card that, yes, you'll be getting five out of ten today, you get six out of ten today. And I've even set, like, incident sheets. Because I remember, as it's like schools, <laughs> you have incident sheet. If there's some fight we had, like some verbal uh, disagreement, I send it as an email. I say, this is, I'm going to date this, I'm going to send this as an email. Everything's professionalized. At the end of the day, we have to look at our families like businesses. You know, I, I personally feel like, let's be professional about it. You know, if there's going I can hear the feminists screaming, absolutely screaming. Gonna be if we can't get along, let's, you know, uh, let's let, let's let's put boundaries in place. Let's, but well, I in right now it's like she knows exactly where my boundaries are. My wife, she knows what will make me happy and what will make me sad. Like it's, it's taken. Ten, I've been married for ten years, I think. So she knows where my boundaries are, and I, and I know where her boundaries are. We respect each other's boundaries, but that sometimes it has to be a formalized process, like. You know, writing it down, putting it electronically. Now, if I have an argument with her, it can just simply be look, refer to point five of the, you know, this thing of the incident sheet. You know, it can be that kind of conversation <laughs> rather than. You know, That's yeah. nuts. In 2013, you had a similar problem. And this is a continuity in your negative behavior from 2013. So this is clearly a persistent problem, you know, and then we have, uh, you know, a discussion about it uh, and vice versa. She can say, look, this is a problem with you. Like, you always do this. I say, no, it's not always because actually, and then I bring the, the, the report card that she does on me. is very important because I use that as evidence that I wasn't always doing that. I say, wait, you're saying I always do that, but you said these good things about me. So that's clearly, it breaks your generalization. Uh, and so to be honest, <laughs> I think this comes from Muhammad's academic background. This all sounds like work, bruv. This all sounds exhausting. Life's already busy. I don't know how you have the energy for this. 
ما شاء الله but this is definitely connected to his uh, academic background because this just sounds long man it's all long so if you have these kind of uh, rules um, and with the kids I have a star sheet in the house I, we haven't been using it for a while but if you do good you star this and that everything has to be professionalized everything has to be formal and professionalized we know where to wake up we know that the food's going to be on my bed forget about table I don't go I have breakfast in bed every single day yeah <laughs> this table thing is for the, for the, for some other men not for me I have the bre- <laughs> 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 this is inspiration mashallah yeah, yeah so when i have the, the Everyone, so all the brothers are saluting you comes on the table and the coffee is there and i drink my coffee and i eat my bread man said the breakfast and on the table for us for other men it's not for me it needs to be in my bed breakfast and i see my wife and my uh, love increases straight away like that so i eat the food i enjoy myself and this and that there's time for everything and, and and then I feel like I want to reciprocate. So I feel like, you know, she's made the breakfast now. Let me take the kids to school. So I have my own duties that I do. I impose upon myself, not because, because I have to. I don't have to do it. I take the children to school. I give them Arabic lesson. I give them this. I give them that. I do swimming with them. Things that she can't do, I do, you know. And, you know, that's how, that's how I do it, you know. That's how I uh, interact. So when are we going to get, you know, Muhammad Hijab's Guide to Successful Marriage? Uh, we well, need, we need 10 more years <laughs> I feel like I've never come out and spoken about this because I'm still in the process of figuring it out no, I mean it's brilliant what you're saying is already you know inspirational gems you can look, see in the chat <laughs> people are no. saluting you and no way I saw this guy's a chat he's he gets demands breakfast in bed at a certain time <laughs> on the dot and... I don't see if this is a problem with that I think this is a, a right because I like to lay down. I like to eat the food. I like. I love it. I, it's what, if something I like it, why wouldn't somebody give it to me? Why would my wife? <laughs> <she knows that. laughs> why wouldn't she give that to me? You know. And obviously, there's all these kind of things. And that's why when I hear like men saying to me things like, "Oh, you know, my wife doesn't give me the physical rights," mm-hmm. you know, I actually get triggered by this thing. Mm-hmm. I'm very triggered by this thing. You know. Because it's sad to see that men are going through this plight, and it's very sad. And likewise with women. Actually, uh, Hamza Zortzis got a a message, someone bragging about my wife. My my wife has never seen me naked. Sorry to say, hmm. bragging about. That. Someone in the chat has just said, uh, Mahdi, we need you to up your production level. Well, let me know what your suggestion is. What what is it that you are looking for, guys? When you say production level, what what are you looking to see? Tell me because I'm I, I want to know from you guys, yani, what you would like to see in terms of the production uh, quality because we've already I've been invested in a few different things already. But tell me because uh, that the architecture side, the architectural side of this is like uh, is foreign to me. So let me know what your suggestions. That I was thinking, what the hell is that to brag about? Like, there's there's a taboo of like the sexual aspect in the in the in the, in the Muslim community, and there's uh, there has to be some level of sexual liberation. I'm not talking about the liberal, <laughs> t- <laughs> but Islamic sexual. Liberation. We have to have an outlet, and the man has to be happy, the woman has to be happy, and yes, the woman has to be very happy. And I think it's a part of manhood. We talk about masculinity. Well, it's a part of manhood to make sure that the woman's always satisfied in that regard. You know, she cannot be upset. You cannot be happy and full up and everything. And she's not. And she has to be satisfied financially. And she has to be satisfied physically. And she has to be satisfied from protection perspective. And that you're a good father and all these things. That's very important, man. I yeah, think so. I think that you're giving us the right balance. You're talking on the one hand, the she has to be satisfied. And on the other hand, I need breakfast in bed on the dot, you know, right? At breakfast, lunch, and dinner served. So that's a good balance. I, I think that's very healthy. And it increases the love, actually, the mahabba that you have because it's a reciprocal exchange. It's not just one way. And yes. she gives you her allegiance, her obedience. She gives you her loyalty. And you give her, you cherish her, you love her, you're affectionate with her. So, I mean, I'm speaking generally about yes, it man be, yeah. and woman. That's the way it should be. So, mashallah, I'm, we want to get this course. We want to get an <laughs> online course, Sapiens Institute, <laughs> Muhammad Hijab. <laughs> Love doctor. <laughs> now, I think Hamza also should give that one because he's got real good tips. This guy, 
you know, a couple of guys in the Dawa, man, uh, that you you probably don't know about them, and I wouldn't mention them, but who have multiple multiple wives, like four wives at the same time, and they all. This is where this is where the challenge is. Having one or two wives is not a challenge. It's, it, I mean, it, two wives is a challenge. Having one wife and looking after one or two wives, you can get you can get by. Where it's like these guys who have four wives and they're they're everywhere and they've got kids with them all. This is a big challenge. Yeah, yeah. But one wife, we should be okay with this, inshallah. You know, we should yeah, be alright. Inshallah. Right. I mean, there's like miskeen in the comments saying we want one wife. <laughs> we can't find one wife even. So. Yeah, well, then you appreciate her more when you get her because I was in your position as well. I was looking for a wife. I was asking everyone. I asked my friend this, that. I went there. I went on the apps. I went pure matrimony. It was there at my time as well. I went on it. And I came on. I came off because I, <laughs> I couldn't find anything I wanted. You know, I went on all of these things. You know, but, so I'm uh, one of you. Don't worry. I've, I've just, I'm just on the other side. It's a different kind of struggle as well. The marriage is a very painful uh, process because you get hurt. You get physically, uh, psychologically hurt, and stuff like that. If if you're not getting what you want, if you're if you've hurt the person, if the person hurts you, it's a it's a very delicate relationship. Do people come to you and ask for uh, hooking up, you know, with a spouse, like brothers who say, "Does your wife know anyone? Can you put us yeah, in contact?" Yeah, yeah. But have you ever thought of doing that in a more organized? I've done way? it. No, not organized. I, I've done, I've made many nikahs in my time. You know, I've I've done the nikah. Not not me myself. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Like I've got brothers married, like a lot of brothers married and stuff like that. And um and uh Alright guys, there's one more segment, uh the feminist destruction of marriage, but unfortunately you guys are gonna have to watch that and listen to that in your own time because I need to go and train right now. First I need to, to to dose myself up with medicine, then I need to go and train. Zakallah for tuning in tuning in. I hope you enjoyed that. Barakallah fikum. Um let's get through the basics if you guys want to book a consultation with me the links will all be in the description which reminds me i need to do that just drop me an email i'll get back in touch with you and i will catch you guys on the next one inshallah like the video on your way out make sure you sub to the channel and i will speak to you guys soon inshallah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh